survival and escape systems. Um, originally, this talk just covered the space uh, applications, and uh, because of my interest in history, I've decided to, to extend it to the, uh, the precursor to space uh, escape systems and, and talk about air uh, aviation and, um, and whatnot. Um, I uh, always have to put my disclosure slide in, which is basically I have conflicts of interest because I work for a lot of different companies. Um, and I'm very actively involved in the commercial space sector. And, uh, and actually, I work for a company, Operator Solutions, that is now providing commercial uh, uh, contingency escape support for uh, launches and landings off the uh, Florida coast. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at or associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, but I won't be representing anybody but myself. So I always like to start off with a slide that kind of captures the essence of it. If we learn, if the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. And so I'm going to have a fairly uh, uh, broad historical overview of uh, the, this, these kinds of technologies that, as they apply to aviation in space. I've done a lot of different things in my career and then I was at 20, uh, 26 years in the Navy. I did uh, diving and hyperbaric medicine. I was a naval flight officer, weapon systems officer, and flight surgeon. Uh, I also had a, a, a background in escape systems with uh, 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 parachuting. I'm still an active pilot, an active parachutist, and an active diver. Um, I was involved in the uh, Columbia survival investigation, uh, which uh, gives me a kind of a basic uh, start for this talk, uh, which was basically we hit, we went and did a historic review of escape systems, and that's uh, the foundation for much of this talk. Our, we're going to cover crew survival and escape, uh, physiologic and technical challenges. Um, all these slides will be made available to you all. Any uh, system in uh, the aerospace environment, they basically uh, cover four different categories, what it can do, uh, how affordable is it, how, uh, re uh, um, how sustainable it is in the sense of um, flying repeat missions. Obviously now uh, commercial space has mastered uh, uh, reusability, which is a total game changer for cost. Uh, and, uh, and the final section is sur survivability. How, how does an aircraft or spacecraft system uh, enhance the crew's protection? So crew survival, this is a, a, a term that is very broad encompassing and it, it's the collective implementation of a board escape, egress, safe haven, emergency medical and rescue recovery. And um, because of this company I'm involved with Operator Solutions, the, they, they uh, provide rescue and recovery and uh, extensive medical support, basically uh, comparable to what the Air Force pararescue jumper uh, groups can do. Um, we like to say that we cover throughout the mission, but not always that is that the case. Um, we want to keep the crew alive and get them back safely to Earth. Um, the key thing about crew survival is the more options you have, the better uh, you have as a chance of surviving a catastrophic situation. These are just some generic terms uh, so that we don't uh, get confused. Egress, escape, abort, rescue, and recovery. And... Um, Generally, egress is uh, before or after a uh, uh, actual leaving the ground, uh, getting out of the vehicle, escape. Uh, we'll talk about, and that's a focus primarily of this talk, although we'll cover some other things. Um, it's just separation from the catastrophic situation. Um, abort uh, means termination of the mission profile. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between an intact abort or non-intact. Intact abort is that you stay with the vehicle and bring it back down. A non-intact abort is that you uh, um, get away from the vehicle. Um, and then rescue and recovery. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a chance to talk on that, even though that's something I'm very actively involved with. Um, when you talk about escape, which is separation of the crew from the vehicle during a catastrophic situation, there are generally five modalities that are available, bailout, ejection seat, extraction rocket, uh, encapsulated seat, um, or modular separation. And then there's a combination of those uh, if it's multiple crew that are involved. And um, in general, a hybrid uh, combination does not offer an equal means of escape. 
So I always like to start out with the history and parachutes uh, actually were developed uh, very shortly after balloons were uh, used to take, take humans off the face of the planet, which was in the late 1700s. Um, and although there have been a, a quite a bit of parachutes uh, early on, some of them were framed with a, um, a structure that held it open. It wasn't really till the uh, early 1900s that parachutes became a very active means of uh, escape for uh, aeronauts, people that were mostly going up in balloons, but also uh, used extensively uh, uh, in aircraft as the uh, history of aviation or aircraft project, uh, increased. I'd like to point out that um, the foundation for much of this was uh, uh, Katchen Paulus, who was a pilot, a parachutist and parachute manufacturer. And she was instrumental in um, providing parachutes for all of the German observation balloons. Uh, and uh, she would test what she was using. So she had, she really was the foundation for much of the modern parachute technology. Um, so we'll talk about bailout and uh, par parachutes were used in World War I primarily uh, by all uh, uh, artillery balloon spotters uh, on, on the different uh, sides. Um, German aircraft were the only ones that routinely used uh, uh, parachutes, but uh, they were often known to not su be successful because of entanglement with the aircraft structure. But here you can see pictures of the uh, parachute system for uh, the balloon observers. Notice that conical shape was a very uh, uh, useful way to get a parachute to deploy. And all the person had to do was just literally jump out of the, uh, the, the uh, gondola or basket. Um, Parachutes uh, development uh, based on the lessons from World War I were uh, majorly advanced in the interwar years in the 1920s. And including the development of a, a parachute system that could be deployed by a, a, a ripcord or, or a parachute release handle as opposed to a static line where that would uh, basically open the parachute as soon as you left the aircraft. And that may not be the best time for a parachute to open, especially when you're close to aircraft structure. Uh, Leslie Irwin uh, became passionate about uh, parachutes and uh, actually formed a, a, par a company called the Irwin Air Chutes. Um, it's interesting that, again, another woman was instrumental in uh, parachute development. This was Tina Broderick, which was her uh, stage name. She was originally a performer in carnivals where she would jump from balloons or aircraft. You can see her sitting there. Uh, this was uh, um, uh, Glenn Martin's uh, was flying along and uh, would drop Tina off. You can see the parachute just suspended uh, uncontained over her head. And she's not in a harness, she's sitting on a little, essentially a swing seat. Uh, later on, harnesses were developed as well as rip cords. And uh, Tina uh, jumped uh, tw over 2000 times and never used a reserve chute. Um, and because of her success in uh, demonstrating the uh, uh, survivability of an escape off of, out of an aircraft, uh, it was extensively used uh, just prior to World War II. Um, another interesting thing um, was that the, uh, anybody that did an escape from a, a aircraft using a parachute would get a, a, a pin called the Caterpillar Club. And you can see uh, that that started early in the, in the 1920s uh, and grew extensively over the uh, uh, war years. It was interesting also to see how many people had won it, including J uh, Jimmy Doolittle, who had, had a three-time Caterpillar Club, and uh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, mostly as an airmail pilot, um, had multiple bailouts because of uh, problems in the aircraft. Um, and the first woman to win one was in World War II as well. Uh, and this is a cool book. Uh, 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 Blessed you, Brother Irwin, for the, and it's the story of the Caterpillar Club. The reason we called Caterpillar was that the parachutes at the time were made out of silk, which were made by caterpillars. So uh, as we uh, proceed after uh, World War I into the 20s and now in the 30s, it's amazing the advancement in technology. So, uh, and, and these are piston aircraft with uh, uh, turbo superchargers 
uh, which were able to get to 50,000 feet uh, with a combustion, uh, uh, internal combustion engine. To do that, though, you had to protect the crew. And uh, Wiley Post, who flew the Winnie Mae in the mid 30s, uh, in the 40s, and 50,000 feet, clearly in the lower realm of the stratosphere, he recognized the need for protection. And he was wearing a suit made by BF Goodrich which is very similar to uh, the commercial diving uh, hard hat suit. Another interesting thing was that the uh, use of a liquid oxygen system, a, a LOX converter, uh, which actually uh, had been developed um, in the you know, early 1900s, uh, allowed a very generous supply of oxygen from a long period of time. Um, and Wiley Post uh, also had a bailout system from the, for the Winnie Mae uh, as you can see here, uh, but you can imagine the encumbrance of trying to get out of a, a vehicle, particularly if it's lost control and is tumbling uh, in a very cumbersome pressure suit uh, and uh, bailout. The reality is that this system like this uh, would really only be really useful if the aircraft broke apart and the occupant was flung free. At around the same time, this is the mid 1930s, it was what I call the first stratospheric uh, race. Uh, and it was mostly uh, using balloons. And there was a, multiple programs in Europe, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States to get to the stratosphere and do various scientific studies, including uh, studying uh, galactic cosmic radiation. Uh, one of the uh, uh, capsule pair of balloons that was launched uh, in, in the 30s was the uh, Explorer 1. Um, and this is the three-man crew, uh, was a joint program between National Geographic and the Army Air Corps. Unfortunately, as the balloon uh, reached uh, its uh, apex, which is, was at 63,000 feet, um, the rubberized canvas balloon material fractured from probably extreme cold and the pressure buildup inside. Um, and uh, the, fortunately, the way the balloon ruptured, it actually formed a parachute, so it slowed the descent down. I'd also like to point out that they reached uh, uh, 63,000 feet, which we'll come to uh, know as the Armstrong line, where water at body temperature uh, spontaneously boils. To protect the crew, they were in a, pr a protective gondola, a pressurized uh, capsule that you saw. And as the um, as this uh, unfortunate uh, uh, program evolved, as the balloon got lower and started to get more aerodynamic resistance, it starts to uh, break apart. And uh, what you see now is the crew starts to egress, uh, but they had a hard time getting out of the hatch because it was fairly small with a parachute on, usually a, a, a rig on the, the abdomen. Um, and so they started to bail out in the uh, you know, five to 6,000 foot range, but it took quite a while for all three of them to get out. And as you see now, the, uh, the final uh, two parachutists get out literally uh, less than a thousand uh, feet above the ground. Um, and they went out in reverse order of rank. So the Lieutenant went out, then the captain, then the major. And as you see the, uh, in the next slide, the capsules impacting ground just as the major <laughs> successfully gets his parachute fully deployed. But it did save the crew and they did fly uh, successfully on Explorer 2 uh, several years later. In World War II, it's not per perhaps commonly known, but um, there was a uh, air war, uh, a technology air war that was going on called the Physiologic Air War. And this is uh, from a colleague of mine, Jay Dean's uh, collection. Um, both the Germans and uh, other uh, uh, allied nations uh, were extensively involved in trying to develop air, uh, aircraft that could fly above the anti-aircraft artillery range, uh, you know, or generally around 35, 40,000 feet. Uh, and also uh, many fighters couldn't fly that high. And so uh, there was uh, an ongoing attempt to improve life support systems uh, such as oxygen and uh, pressure breathing oxygen, as well as escapes uh, from uh, damaged aircraft. And so I'll tell you about this famous jump made by uh, Randy Loveless, who was a uh, Army Air Corps flight surgeon. 
uh, who was taken up in a, a B-17 to 40,000 feet um, in 1943. He'd never made a parachute jump before and he wanted to test the system. So he uh, basically uh, had a parachute that would deploy with a static line. So as soon as he exited at 40,000 feet, um, the parachute opened and um, unknown at the time to him uh, and others, the danger of high altitude opening shock. Essentially, as soon as the parachute opened, the G-forces uh, ripped his glove and his oxygen mask off. The parachute descended slowly about a thousand feet per minute until he reached the ground. But uh, essentially, uh, there was no signs of life until uh, you know quite quite a bit lower as the chase aircraft saw him um, move an arm, they realized that he was at least not dead. Um, but anyway, uh, there were a lot of lessons from this uh, high altitude uh, test program uh, that led to further subsequent uh, evaluations of opening shock at different altitudes. And suffice it to say that uh, because of the uh, reduced air density, the parachute has to uh, travel at a much faster uh, true airspeed, and in doing so, it generates massive G-forces. And so uh, what you can see there is that uh, when you're jumping in the 35 to 40,000 foot range, uh, you're uh, in excess of uh, 30 to 40 G-forces on you. And the, the G-forces are so intense that they actually would tear uh, the, the parachute risers uh, and, and, and obviously um, injure the, apple, uh, the, uh, the jumper. The other thing is that the onset rate of G-forces, uh, the jolt or, or uh, it's also called the stab, the G onset rate was, was uh, much more rapid as well. And if you remember your um, bi uh, biomechanics impact injury, it's worse if you have uh, the G-force applied in a in a very short time frame, as opposed to spread out over time. So these early studies showed that uh, opening shock was worse, as well as the opening G onset rate. So throughout the uh, high altitude test program, uh, the second stratospheric race uh, was in the 50s and 60s, um, and it was mostly between the uh, U.S. and the Soviet Union. Uh, both the Navy, U.S. Navy and, and U, uh, U.S. Air Force uh, had high altitude pair, uh, balloon programs uh, and the Air Force always had an escape system for all of their balloon programs, which included uh, Man High, which you see on the left and Stargazer on the right, as well as the um, parachute test program called Excelsior, which was uh, done in three parachute jumps in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, by Joe Kittinger, who also was the test uh, uh, balloonist for the Manhigh program and found that uh, on his uh, Manhigh one that he had an oxygen system failure and they had to come down um, early because the a valve had been put in backwards. But Excelsior was a, a really uh, intense program that reached 102,800 feet and successfully demonstrated that you could jump from the, uh, you know, the upper portions of the stratosphere. Although you can see uh, Joe Kittinger in this picture and the video shows the same thing, that there was a lot of uh, mo movement uh, and uh, uncontrollability in its free fall. Uh, and here you can see a, a view of the 102,000 foot jump and notice how unstable he is falling down. Um, one thing that happened um, on his uh, last jump is that he lost suit pressure in his uh, pressure suit on his right hand and his hand basically swelled up to fill the glove and this was a demonstration of uh, water uh, expanding at high altitudes above Armstrong's line and um, it's it, it didn't pre depressurize the whole suit uh, because it was a partial pressure suit but it, his hand was swollen up three times the normal size and uh, it was totally non-functional, but it recovered within several hours of getting back on the ground. Around the same time, the Russian uh, Soviet Union uh, had a high altitude parachute program that uh, used balloons. And also uh, their capsule was actually the Vostok 
capsule that the um, Soviet Union used on their first successful uh, rocket launches. In 1962, two test jumpers jumped out of this capsule, which is shown here in a museum in Moscow. Um, and uh, the two test parachutists, uh, one was going to go out with an ejection seat, Gainey and Dreyoff on the on the left, and uh, the second guy was going to go out because the ejection seat was gone. Now he was just going to bail out. That was Peter Dolgov. Both of them are very experienced military parachutists and test parachutists. Unfortunately, the systems that they were using, which were what was used in high altitude uh, Soviet aircraft, with it was a, um, a fishbowl uh, helmet. And sure enough, when uh, Peter Dolgoff went out, uh, uh, he uh, clipped the back of his fishbowl helmet and punched a hole in it. And um, unfortunately, the loss of pressure in this case resulted in his death, probably from a combination of ebulism and other um, pressure related phenomena like um, decompression bubbles forming as well. Um, in the mid 60s, a civilian parachutist, Nick Pianata in the US um, got access to a, a pressure suit, a David Clark suit and went on three occasions to the stratosphere. Um, on multiple uh, early flights, he had systems failures, uh, including one flight he got to 123,000 feet but couldn't disconnect and so he couldn't free fall and had to ride the parachute or had to ride the balloon back down. On his third uh, sojourn in 1966, um, his visor inadvertently opened. And there's a, a lot of speculation as to what the cause of that was. But uh, at the time, the system had, a, 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 uh, you push the right side to open the sun visor and the left side would open the pressure visor. And it was, uh, for some reason, the pressure visor opened at altitude and he also perished. And, uh, he, he didn't die immediately, but he died several months later from anoxic brain damage. So let's talk about the next system for escape in aircraft is the ejection seat. And uh, here's where this historical review revealed some fascinating uh, insights. Ejection seats are very uh, common in all military uh, high performance aircraft because of the need to get out uh, very quickly and also to not hit the tail. Um, but the first ejection seat uh, for an aircraft was actually developed before World War I uh, using a propulsive charge that would throw, uh, the, um, throw the occupant out of the uh, aircraft. Um, obviously, um, there's a lot of challenges that had to be uh, uh, refined over the several uh, decades following this early test. Um, and uh, the uh, routine use of ejection seats was used uh, in World War II, mostly by uh, the Luftwaffe of the German Air Force, uh, and actually uh, was used in, in saved 60 aircrew. Uh, but also uh, Sweden was working on ejection seats, um, and we'll show you why in a second. Um, the, uh, there were aircraft that had uh, pusher props. In other words, the propeller is behind the, uh, uh, the tail. And you can imagine trying to bail out and miss the uh, propeller. So the, uh, the uh, Dornier 335, the FAL, uh, uh, which means arrow, uh, had a, an ejection seat for obvious reasons. Um, the Swiss also had a pusher prop system and tail boom. And so to clear the uh, propeller and tail boom, they also developed ejections, an ejection seat system. It's interesting, um, the company that uh, Martin Baker company originally was an aircraft company, uh, but when uh, uh, Valentin Baker uh, died in an aircraft accident, his partner, Jim uh, James B uh, Martin, decided to switch the company to developing crew safety systems. And the Martin Baker ejection seat uh, is certainly uh, one of the best ejection seats in the world. Um, I love to look at the uh, the testing of it. You know, we obviously can use mannequins and in some cases live animals like bears, uh, but they also used a human test uh, uh, parachutist, uh, Benny Lynch, uh, and he made 31 ejections in his career. So anybody that can say, 
hey, you know, uh, ejection seats are bad for you, you should go talk to uh, Benny Lynch. Um, as of the middle of this year, there's been over 7,600 saves from the Martin Baker ejection seats. Um, so ejection seats have a lot of uh, physiologic and technical challenges to overcome. Um, and we'll just go through a couple of these. Um, obviously the uh, aerodynamic forces on a human at the, uh, high speeds can cause what's called aerodynamic flail where your extremities um, are basically pulled in various directions and disarticulated. Um, the uh, other thing that can happen uh, is that even uh, though the seat and the human are stable, the whole system can spin aerodynamically and you can get uh, essentially a high speed spin, which can be injurious. And generally these injuries increase uh, at uh, much higher speeds, uh, you know, and above 420 knots equivalent airspeed or true airspeed. Uh, it's it's a, a, at least 25% chance of injury and, uh, and above 600 uh, knots you get uh, fatalities. And this is a, a chart that shows the, uh, the risk profile uh, for body weight and, and uh, ejections uh, at uh, ejection uh, airspeed. Um, but suffice it to say that there have been survivals in aircraft. Um, in the case of the SR-71, there have been two breakups that have been pretty well documented. Uh, these are in excess of Mach 3. Uh, but because of the higher altitude, the equivalent airspeed is, is a little bit lower. Um, so I'll talk about these two mishaps that occurred in 1966. Um, the first one was uh, documented uh, it, when uh, uh, the SR-71, and you can see those very uh, large engines that are far out on the wings, were notorious for getting uh, um, uh, essentially what's like uh, equivalent of a compressor stall, uh, which was called an unstart. And basically the um, supersonic uh, airflow uh, gets disrupted across the blades and the engine quits working. And in this mishap, what happened was um, the vehicle turned, well, had an unstart and turned sideways. And because of the sideways configuration, hitting the, the three, Mach 3, uh, it broke apart. And um, we had managed to get this uh, uh, mishap declassified so we could study it in, as part of the Red Bull Stratus project that I was involved with. And basically uh, the uh, summary showed that the, uh, the, the one fatality was the backseater who hit the uh, uh, supersonic wind flow and basically broke his neck. Uh, they thought it might've been from a, uh, a spin, but um, our analysis uh, felt that it was more likely to be shock-shock interaction where you get shear and cleavage planes that can basically uh, cause a, a, a break, uh, you know, and, and um, musculoskeletal systems. And the, uh, the other thing that we, was noted by the pilot who in the front seat who survived, he said that he couldn't see anything in free fall because his uh, visor completely uh, was occluded by um, icing. And the second mishap happened about six months later, and this was a very interesting test flight. Um, if you notice, this SR-71 has a, a drone on the top of it, and this was the, uh, uh, the A-12 variant, which was used by the CIA, where they would take this uh, drone and fly it up uh, a, into a contested border area and, and launch the drone. And uh, this was the second drone uh, release. And this time, the, instead of doing a pushover to get away from the drone, they decided to launch it in level flight. And what happened is the drone hit the um, uh, supersonic turbulence off of the nose and basically uh, lawn darted into the um, vehicle and broke it apart, as we'll see in this video. So you can see the, uh, the drone is released um, and uh, it basically careens into the, uh, into the uh, SR-71 and breaks apart. And we'll talk a little bit about these later, but we did an extensive analysis of both those two SR-71 mishaps. Ironically, 
uh, both crew survived that second breakup, um, but um, one of them drowned in the water. And it just shows you that even though you're back on earth and until you're you know, back at home, you're not safe. Uh, landing in the water with a, a pressure suit is um, very, very dangerous as uh, has been demonstrated in the Mercury uh, Redstone 4 mission with Gus Grissom when his uh, suit filled up with water. Another escape system that's used in aircraft is the uh, tractor rocket. And it is um, a, usually a post modification uh, to aircraft that didn't have an ejection seat. Uh, and it's a, a system that uses a, a, a rocket that basically pulls the air crew out of the, uh, out of the aircraft. And this was a, a modification that was used in the uh, Sky Raider, uh, the A-1 uh, close air support um, aircraft used extensively in Vietnam for um, um, rescue missions to suppress enemy uh, ground fire. And you can see that, that when, it, when it's initiated, the, a rod breaks through the canopy and then a tractor rocket uh, is thrown out and it ignites over your head and pulls you out of the aircraft. Um, believe it or not, the tractor rockets are still used for escape systems in the uh, um, um, uh, Russian KA-50 and 52, which have been used extensively in uh, Ukraine. Um, the thing is, it's a very complex system that requires explosive bolts to sever the uh, overhead rotors and then the tractor rocket extracts the crew. And, and so uh, because of the several second evolution that this requires in low altitude, uh, the, a lot of these are brought down by uh, man portable uh, air defense heat seeking missiles and they don't have time to actually save the crew. Uh, the next kind of system that, that is used in escape is the uh, uh, encapsulated seed also called an escape pod. And uh, it was extensively used in the uh, uh, B-58 Hustler, which was a Delta wing supersonic fighter. And this is an interesting system. Um, this clamshell uh, protective layer, mostly to keep the aerodynamic forces away from the crew, um, as well as pressurizing the, the inside of the uh, pod, uh, was uh, extensively evaluated. Um, uh, the B-58 didn't stay in the inventory too long, but it, it was a very, uh, very uh, well thought out system. Um, it was put to use in other aircraft like the uh, reconnaissance F-4, uh, which was also a supersonic uh, aircraft, as you can see here. Um, and so they were retrofit uh, after uh, deciding that they needed these high, this high speed protection. They put these in, in some of the aircraft. Obviously, it reduces visibility, so it's not very good if you're trying to do air combat maneuvering because you can't see behind you or to your sides, uh, but it will protect you in a case of a supersonic ejection. Um, the next system uh, that's thought of is essentially basically breaking apart the vehicle into separate components with the crew module um, basically uh, breaking off uh, in an organized fashion with pyrotechnic uh, separators. Once again, um, that system was uh, actually developed in World War II in several German aircraft. Um, that uh, basically uh, because of the high speed, um, the, the decision was to, rather than try to eject is you just basically pyrotechnically separate the module and, uh, and come back down inside uh, that module. The Natter, which was a rocket propelled launcher uh, interceptor, basically it would shoot straight up into the uh, air and then attack formations with the nose uh, mounted rockets. And then um, to bring the crew back down, instead of trying to land the uh, uh, aircraft, the, you would ju just do a modular separation. Uh, and uh, that was used on several occasions. Modular systems have been used extensively in some aircraft, particularly the uh, FB-111. Uh, FB uh, which was a swept wing fighter bomber. Um, and because of its high speed, low altitude uh, mission, 
uh, the aerodynamic flail would be so dangerous that the crew, it was decided that the crew would eject in this modular system. As you can see here, both crew members uh, eject and separate from it. The, air, the uh, module actually has aerodynamic canards on it to stabilize it, and then it comes down on airbags. Uh, this was also uh, used for the uh, um, um, the uh, the B1A, which you can see this test of the uh, B1A system, which was a four-person crew module. Parachutes deploy and airbags. Rockwell's engineers tackled the problem of crew survivability from a stricken plane in exactly the same way General Dynamics had with the F-111 crew capsule. But for the B-1, with a crew of four, it would have to be much larger and tolerances would be greater. But you can see that they make a, a, fa a fairly soft landing uh, with that system. Modular systems were also used in some of the early X planes in the uh, X2, uh, which is a, a Mach 1 plus uh, 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 test vehicle had a modular system similar to uh, previous versions where a single person crew uh, would uh, come down inside the vehicle. Unfortunately, the one time it was used, it didn't work um, successfully. And part of the reason for that was the decision was made that the module would separate you from the supersonic condition and then get to a lower altitude. And then the crew member would have to bail out of the module and uh, for some reason in this mishap, which killed Mel App, uh, uh, he, he, he did not separate from the module once, the, um, uh, once he descended to a lower altitude and so he perished. Uh, I had a, another kind of spin-off version of the uh, module or system is an airframe parachute. And rather than separate uh, the air, the, the uh, crew from the aircraft, the whole aircraft comes down under parachute. And there, this was actually demonstrated by Roscoe Turner in 1929 in a biplane where he brought the whole uh, aircraft down by parachute. And it was also used uh, uh, at least in concept stage for other aircraft, including very large aircraft. But airframe parachutes are used extensively currently um, in a number of different settings. There's this uh, Cirrus airframe parachute system, uh, which is made by the ballistic recovery system. And uh, it's uh, saved quite a few lives over the years, um, well over 200 lives. Although it's controversial because people think, well, I can get away with a lot. And so they may do riskier kinds of activities like flying in bad weather or turbulence. Um, it's also able to be retrofitted on other small light aircraft like the uh, Cessna 172 and 182. Uh, it's, and it's also been used in hang gliders. Uh, um, interestingly enough, the idea of uh, getting a parachute to open quickly with a uh, ballistic spreader um, <laughs> dates back to the 19, early 1900s. Here you can see a car being uh, driven down a road and you see the, the uh, parachute uh, being shot out. And what ballistic spreaders are is essentially there's little weights in the skirt of the parachute and the, uh, uh, a charge throws the parachute up to get the lines taut and then it throws the, uh, the weight, weighted skirt out rapidly. And the reason that that's very useful is it allows a very low altitude parachute deployment where ordinarily the aerodynamic forces to open a parachute would take longer. And the fact that the ballistic spreader has put the parachute in its fully open configuration is, is a value. Obviously you wouldn't want that at a high altitude where you wanted a slower opening, uh, but for a low altitude opening, ballistic spreaders are very useful. So let's switch gears now to the um, space environment. And We'll, we'll go over a little bit more than just the escape systems for space spacecraft. We'll also go over uh, some of the other uh, components, remember, um, such as egress and, and uh, um, other uh, crew survival components. In the early 1950s, uh, Werner von Braun uh, drew up ideas about um, future space travel, and this was the Third, uh, third of the Collier series called 
how will man meet emergencies in space travel? And um, it uh, shows a very uh, interesting concept. One is it's a winged spacecraft. And two is it uses these escape pods or encapsulated seats, as you can see here, uh, being kicked out of the uh, vehicle uh, in case of a, an emergency. And these are uh, on the bottom left is the uh, hand drawings of Werner von Braun and then the artist's con, um, depiction of it on the, on the, on the right side. Um, there were several interesting features of it. The crew could operate normally in their um, vehicle and then uh, at, at, a, at a, an appropriate time, if they needed to go into the escape pod, you can see that they um, uh, activate the uh, telescoping escape pod system, very similar to that B-58 clamshell, that segmented clamshell that was used, uh, and then come down under, under a parachute. Now, the parachute was not adequate. That little teeny parachute would, was more like a drogue chute. You need something that would be quite a bit larger to actually successfully um, have a no, low enough in, uh, landing forces to not injure the crew. So when we talk about spacecraft, um, and the part of the challenge is spacecraft as opposed to aircraft is uh, significantly, significantly higher speeds. Um, to get to, to low Earth orbit, you have to have a, a spacecraft uh, that reaches escape velocity, and that's generally 17,500 miles in an hour. So that's a significantly higher speed than uh, aircraft will typically fly. So we'll talk a little bit about this approach. One is, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the difference between an intact versus a non-intact. And a non-intact is that you basically are not gonna come down in the, uh, in the vehicle, you're gonna come down in some component of the vehicle or an actual uh, completely separate from it. Whereas intact abort, it means that you come down in the, in the uh, original vehicle. And in general, um, winged vehicles are more amenable to a non-intact abort, uh, whereas capsule systems, the concept is you come down in the vehicle. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into this uh, further. Um, another really important aspect is the, how much of the mission phase does the escape system operate in? And um, obviously, a full envelope means that no matter what you where you are, either on the launch pad all the way down to touchdown or, or um, capsule landing, um, that's called a full envelope uh, coverage. Partial envelope means there are phases of the mission where you do not have the ability to escape. Uh, and the classic one was the space shuttle. During the two minutes of flight with the solid rocket motor propulsion, there was no opportunity to escape at all. And obviously that's the high dynamic phase of flight where you're going from the launch pad at zero speed to an excess of you know, Mach 1. And um, if something bad happens, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, the other thing is, and there's a huge debate about this now in the commercial sector, is crew protective systems in the form of spacesuits. And um, you'll see, for the most part, a lot of the suborbital vehicles, like Blue Origins, um, uh, New Shepard and Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two uh, do not use a pressure suit. They, don't, in fact, they just wear a standard jumpsuit. Um, so they do not have the full protection of exposure above Armstrong's line. You know, which is sixty-three thousand feet. Um, and the reason they do that is it's a savings in weight, which is a, obviously a major concern and complexity. And the, another factor, uh, and I was heavily involved in Virgin Galactic's decision not to use a, a pressure suit by basically showing them what it was like to work in a pressure suit. Uh, we were using Sokol suits. And the problem is that you have a lot of heat retention and uh, suits are confining, they restrict mobility and um, 
they are very hot. Even with cooling systems, they can overheat. And uh, in spaceflight early on, the uh, um, possibility of developing motion sickness is very high and it's significantly worsened it, when you have a high heat load. So the, the decision for current suborbital systems is not to use a pressure suit for uh, those reasons, um, but it does leave them somewhat vulnerable uh, if they have a capsule depressurization in the uh, stratosphere and, 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 beyond, uh, and above. Um, the other thing is, is how much of the crew uh, how much do crew have to do? And, and uh, you can have systems that are fully automated where uh, the crew doesn't have to do anything and the system, including the, the escape system, is activated. Um, for intact abort systems in capsules, that's a much easier thing to do. For non-intact where you have to get out of the vehicle, um, there are invariably going to be crew duties involved. And then I like to always add that no matter what, you've got to consider post landing support prior to crew recovery forces arriving, uh, as we'll get into a little bit later. So these are some of the phases that we'll talk about in the air in the spacecraft survivability coverage range. Um, we'll talk about the launch pad. Uh, we'll talk about uh, launch and entry. We'll talk about on orbit uh, opportunities. Uh, including the safe haven and uh, transfer to a, uh, a rescue vehicle and then abort and return. And then just briefly talk about um, post landing uh, survivability concerns. The launch pad is super dangerous um, because of the uh, propellants, some of which are um, very, very toxic. Uh, cryogenics like liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, several hundred degrees below. Uh, uh, several hundred degrees uh, below zero, uh, cold, um, fire, falls, um, all kinds of various kinds of things. And um, we've learned that, unfortunately, very early in the program when uh, a launch pad disaster occurred in 1960 and killed, uh, immediately killed over 70 people, and then uh, another 50 died from the post uh, fire and uh, other uh, toxic exposures. Um, and that was a, uh, a, a very uh, unfortunate lesson um, that when you look at it in hindsight, you go, what were they thinking? Um, basically working on a vehicle while it was uh, still fueled. And typically you wanna take the fuel out of the vehicle if you're gonna do any maintenance uh, work on it, but they were trying to make, meet a, a launch deadline and they paid the price for it. Um, for ground egress, there's a lot of different systems that are, uh, have been used uh, out throughout the years. I'll just go through some of these. Um, you know, in Mercury, especially the Mercury Redstone, they used a, a cherry picker. So in other words, they just a, basically a line, a lineman's device that they use to service high, uh, high uh, electrical lines. Gemini used an ejection seat. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then Apollo had a very robust ground egress system, including a slide wire system, a high-speed elevator, and also a uh, Teflon line tube. Um, and so we'll just talk a little bit about some of these. Here's the cherry picker. And you can imagine after the uh, gantries moved away from the uh, uh, tower, or from the uh, spacecraft that the only way to get them out once that happens in an emergency is to put this cherry picker out, which is obviously kind of a kludgy system. And it was obvious that ground escape was not a primary thought uh, uh, when they did this. Um, here's the underneath uh, launch pad 37A and B, there are these huge rooms that can hold 24 people. Uh, and uh, it includes both the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, astronaut crew as well as the closeout and uh, recovery crew. So if they're on the pad and something bad happens, uh, everybody just goes down this tube. They just, you know, it's like one of those trash chutes you see on high uh, story buildings that are being renovated and basically you get in that tube and you go zipping down and then at the bottom, it kind of makes a 90 degree uh, gradual turn and you slide into this um, 
shock mounted uh, concrete protective room. If there was a massive launch pad uh, uh, emergency and the and everybody got down in there, they could survive for a, over a day as the fuel of the uh, rockets burned up. And you can uh, see some of the explosions like uh, the N1 Russian uh, Soviet lunar system burned for days afterwards. So this kind of idea that you can do, uh, you know, have a uh, underground safe haven for egress is also there. Um, in the shuttle program, they had a ground egress uh, either with an elevator or slide wire baskets and the crew and their fully, uh, you know, their full uh, um, crew escape suits would um, go to these uh, slide wire baskets that could hold three crew each. And there were seven of those, so you could carry 21 people. So even you could take the uh, astronauts crew, which is usually up to seven, and then also the closeout or pad crew. And those were tested for every terminal countdown demonstration test in the shuttle program. Uh, and this is just shows you those slide wires come down and they basically come zipping into this net uh, and, and stop. And then there's a, a safe haven uh, concrete shelter there that they can get in. Um, for uh, emerging systems, the idea of a slide wire um, was felt to be uh, too slow and based on high speed amusement park rides, they've gone with this uh, basically a, a, a high speed uh, gondola system on a rail. Um, and so you see this is the system that's being looked at for the, uh, for the uh, uh, was looked at for Constellation and um, uh, which was now a canceled program. But the concept is it would actually get you out of there a lot quicker. Uh, slide wires take several minutes to slide down there. They seem to be painfully slow, whereas this thing would be re really fast. Um, the Boeing Starliner uh, uses a zip line system, individual zip lines for their crew. And uh, SpaceX uses a, the, this, uh, the slide wire system uh, for basically what the shuttle uh, used for their uh, their escape system. And this is actually the um, demo crew two uh, doing this test uh, on terminal countdown tests several years ago. Um, another means of escape uh, from the pad is a launch escape tower. And uh, launch escape towers were used for the Mercury and Apollo program, as well as the, the Soyuz program, which has been around since the late 60s. And basically you have a tractor rocket that pulls the capsule off of the pad. Uh, Mercury, um, there were uh, six of these tests done uh, to demonstrate the uh, survivability of it. And there's a number of parameters that have to be met to make that successful. Obviously it has to get away from the catastrophic situation it has to orient the capsule so the parachutes can deploy in a timely fashion. And you, you can't have forces on the crew that are so high that it would cause damage. Um, if you ever go to Johnson Space Center, you'll see this Little Joe 2 system out front of the uh, Space Center. That was used four times, including one of the launches. Uh, actually, there, the, the, the rocket failed and the escape system actually did did what it was supposed to do. Soyuz has been extensively studied uh, and used and has advanced in recent years to having both a tractor rocket that pulls it off and a pusher rocket that is able to push it away from. The tractor rockets for all of these systems, um, be it Mercury, Apollo, Soyuz, um, have to, that, that launch escape tower is only good for low altitudes. And it usually is separated after the first and second stage separation have occurred. So if you watch the Apollo 13 movie, you see them say on launch, they have, they push the button called tower jet and that's the tower jettison. So a launch escape system, a tractor rocket system is only used for somewhere in the lower altitudes. Um, you know, in other words, when the uh, first and second stage separates. And after that, the only way you can do it is a, is a pusher system, as we'll get into. Now, as it turns out, the, uh, um, 
just recently there was an ascent aboard where that pusher system did work. And that was uh, in 2018 uh, on uh, Soyuz MS-10 uh, uh, for uh, a variety of reasons, uh, the four booster rockets uh, come off and separate, but one of the booster rockets hinge at the top didn't separate. And so the uh, basically the spacecraft started to tumble and that um, pusher rocket, by, the, by this time, the uh, tower, the escape tower had already been jettisoned. So now they use this pusher system to push it away from the damage. Um, and so this was a, a very robust system that's continually been refined over the years. Um, and obviously it saved the uh, MS-10 crew. Um, Orion, which is the uh, program that's gonna be doing the deep space missions, the gateway and the lunar um, missions uh, is a very big capsule, could hold maybe six crew. Uh, and so it has a similar arrangement as to the updated Soyuz, which is a tractor rocket that's going to be used for low altitude aboards. And notice it has this protective uh, aero shell that's used to um, protect against the dynamic pressures at low altitude when it's going through Mach 1 and above. Um, and as, as, uh, the, for, as the Soyuz, the, for, after first, second stage separation, this upper system uh, is jettisoned, it flies off of the capsule. And now what you're left with is the tractor rocket system, which is behind, I mean, not the tractor rocket, but the, but the pusher rocket system below. And so you can see these different aborts uh, systems basically have two uh, escape systems, a low altitude system during dynamic pressure, and then a higher altitude system that's used, um, and it's very interesting. We'll talk about that. two, one, launch, launch, launch. The flight test of Orion's launch abort system. The test, performed in New Mexico and simulated using Lockheed Martin investment hardware and software, was 100% successful. The abort system worked flawlessly as its 500,000 pounds of thrust propelled the test spacecraft a mile up and a mile away from danger allowing it to parachute safely back to Earth. So that was a good test of the pad abort capability. In other words, if you had something on the launch pad, you could get it high enough that the capsule would uh, come back down safely. And if you watch that video, what you see is that the rockets uh, fire and then they change their thrust to move it so that it's such that the vehicle basically comes out and uh, deploys the parachute safely. Um, so there's a lot to it, even though the, uh, it doesn't seem like there's much there going on there. There's a lot of different things that have to happen in a certain sequence for a successful uh, abort. Um, this next video is the low out. This is a test of the pusher rocket um, that was done, even though it's launched from the ground, essentially this is this would be used for a much higher altitude uh, ascent aboard. And uh, I'll show you this video in just a second. So uh, here's the ascent aboard test. Oh, actually, uh, actually, I didn't I didn't turn the video on, but basically, um, they did an ascent aboard test using the pusher rocket system. Now, the SpaceX Crew Dragon, if you notice, um, it does not have a launch escape tower tractor rocket system. It uses the Super Dracos um, as, a, uh, as the ascent abort and pad abort capability. And so here you see the, the Super Dracos uh, firing off the pad. Originally, this system was developed by uh, SpaceX to do propulsive landings of the capsule, i.e. to land a capsule without using a parachute, uh, much like they bring the boosters back down with propulsive uh, landing capability. Uh, but they decided, that, and, and NASA decided that that capability, they always want to land with a parachute, even though some at some stage in the future, uh, SpaceX may allow propulsive landings of humans in capsules. Uh, right now, they have to come down with a parachute, but that 
system, the propulsive landing system originally designed for SpaceX was be, is able to be used uh, as, a, as, a, as a pusher rocket for ascent and, and, and pad aborts, as you can see here. And um, this is a this was uh, just a few years ago. They did an actual ascent abort test. So this was a capsule uncrewed, but a test of the ascent abort system. And what you see there is the uh, um, capsule uh, ascent abort engines are fired to get away from a breakup of, of the uh, of this uh, of the booster system. And that was a successful test. Um, the other neat thing about that pusher rocket capability is even way, way down range. Um, what happens is that if you have an ascent abort somewhere um, much farther down range, um, it, the, 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 those pusher rockets can basically turn the trajectory of the uh, capsule and head back to land for closer uh, crew recovery to land. And so uh, that's a so it's a multimodal system originally designed for propulsive human landings, now being used for pad abort, ascent abort, and uh, downrange uh, cross track uh, change. Um, and the nominal crew dragon comes down under four parachutes, but a three parachute system, which was intentionally failed here, uh, still demonstrated a successful uh, impact loads. Now Boeing, which is far behind SpaceX Crew Dragon, has uh, they still haven't flown a successful uncrewed mission, uh, let alone crewed. But what they uh, you see here is that on one of their tests, they and they use a three parachute system, that one of the parachutes failed, and that would probably be close to an injury threshold. Uh, so. Um, this was an unfortunate event for space or for uh, for for Boeing. Um, so let's talk about escape systems for uh, spacecraft. Bailout, as you can imagine, with the high speeds involved, are very going to be a very a significant challenge. So let's see where bailouts have been used or could be considered. First off. The very first flights of the US space program in the suborbital Mercury Redstone capsule, which didn't go into orbit, just went up, up, you know, above the uh, von Karman line and then came back down in a, in a trajectory, uh, basically a 15 minute flight with a very short five minute or so period of microgravity. This was a new test system. And they were very worried that the capsule parachutes that would normally bring the crew back safely would fail. And so even though it was a capsule and typically for capsule systems, you stay in the vehicle, i.e. You, you keep it as an intact abort, they put a parachute bailout system for the crew on those two flights, the Alan Shepard on Mercury Redstone 4 or 3 and Gus Grissom on Mercury Redstone 4. And so you can see that they had this parachute system there. After the capsule is launched and is coming back down, if the parachute on the capsule is not adequate in slowing the vehicle down, the crew would bail out. Now, this is one of the reasons why the hatch was designed to blow very quickly so they could get out. And um, there was a lot of controversy over Gus Grissom's capsule landing that he blew the hatch, but it's now subsequently been shown that it was most likely static electricity that fired the hatch and the capsule filled up with water. But the reason they had a, a hatch that would be so easy to open was that they had this emergency bailout system in place for Mercury Redstone. They did not use the uh, crew bailout system for the Mercury uh, uh, Atlas systems, which were the orbital flights, because they had demonstrated the capsule parachute system was adequate for crew survival. Um, now, in 1986, uh, the Challenger broke up on the 25th flight of the space shuttle. And this was four years into the, uh, or uh, five years into the uh, space shuttle history. 
And what they, in the analysis of this, which we went and the Columbia survival investigation, we went back and extensively reviewed all lessons to learn from the Challenger mishap. And what was very evident in the footage of the Challenger mishap is that the crew was alive after the breakup. And that circled area here is the crew module and the crew are still alive. They are unconscious because they did not have a pressure suit and they're about 50,000 feet at this point, um, but they are, they are alive. And they actually did, they, uh, as you can see here um, in these uh, blown up images of the uh, breakup, you can see the crew module completely torn apart, completely free. Um, and it, it actually attained a stable course until water impact, uh, basically pointy end down until water impact. So as a result of that lessons from that, where the crew survived and uh, and actually some had performed emergency procedures, even though there wasn't much to do. Um, it was decided that there needed to be a system for crew survival in the case of a breakup. So they came up with this very ingenious after uh, modification of the um, vehicle, which was basically to jettison the, the hatch on the left side, deploy a, a, a telescopic pole um, so that the, this pole would allow them to uh, bail out and get below the left wing leading edge. And in the subsequent analysis after the Challenger mishap, they realized that they could never water ditch in the space shuttle because the vehicle speeds were too high. It would just basically break apart as soon as it touched down, even if it was a very soft touchdown. So they realized that even without a breakup, if there was ever a scenario where the shuttle is launched and it cannot come back and do a land landing, um, it would have to do an overwater bailout. And that was the um, mode eight uh, bailout. Get out of the vehicle, uh, bail out over water, have a life raft and survive till rescue forces got you. But it would also work in the case of a breakup, like happened in the uh, Challenger mis mishap, which was what instigated this whole development process. So they put pressure suits back in, and they put a parachute and bailout bottles back in. And um, the, the suits evolved initially. It was a partial pressure suit. And, and in the mid-90s, they switched to a, a full pressure suit. Um, but it had a parachute and bailout bottles, a life raft, survival equipment. Um, and this suit was a very similar to the design we used for the uh, Red Bull Stratus mission, except that we used a conformal helmet um, as opposed to a uh, helmet with, that you could move around inside of it. Um, this is an interesting thing that the, the, the Advanced Crew Escape Suit um, was certified to 100,000 feet uh, and 600 knots, which is a very dangerous uh, speed. Um, but it was certified to 100,000 feet because Joe Kittinger demonstrated that you could jump from that height and survive. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, we know from the SR-71 breakups that uh, you know, that you could survive a, a fairly high um, uh, speed, roughly, uh, you know, 400 miles an hour. Um, I mean, uh, it, uh, Mach 3 would, would have been a much higher, uh, would have been much uh, faster than um, most aircraft. And we uh, talk about uh, dynamic pressure in pounds per square foot, and the serious injury threshold is right around a, a, a thousand PSF. Um, and the Columbia crew module and the SR-71 breakups were both around 400 uh, pounds per square foot. So um, what was very evident in our analysis in the Columbia mishap is that the crew were still in a survival, survivable envelope when the, their vehicle broke apart. Um, in fact, uh, what was interesting in the Challenger mishap, uh, 
was that a crew could survive an ascent breakup up to 280,000 feet and could survive a reentry breakup uh, at about 180,000 feet. Um, so why is there a difference in ascent and entry? The reason is if you break up on ascent, um, basically, just like the Challenger did, you're going to loft to a certain altitude, you're going to stop, and you're going to have zero airspeed, and then you're going to come back down. Whereas an entry coming in from space, you're carrying a lot more kinetic energy uh, in the form of the orbital velocity that you're trying to dissipate prior to landing. So that's why there's a kind of a difference between a survivable envelope in, on ascent versus uh, re-entry. Um, as a result of the crew survival lessons learned in Columbia, we ended up putting crew in a, uh, a training pro profile where we actually trained them in what it would be like to try to bail out from a crew module that was pointy end down coming back to Earth. And believe me, this was really a challenge. Um, here's Nick Patrick, who's an astronaut. He now works for Blue Origin, uh, but he was one of the test subjects. And it was very hard to get around in that pressure suit. Uh, especially from the flight deck, crawled through the hatch and get out that hole. But uh, if your life depended on it, you'd probably do everything you could to get out. Bottom line is that this uh, escape uh, and bailout from the, sh the shuttle in an ascent breakup or even a, a, or, or a reentry breakup would be a real challenge. Um, there is a bailout capability for Spaceship One and Two. Um, and spaceship one, the you pull that little red handle, uh, and that little red handle that's in the front of the nose cone, and it basically jettisons the the the, the forward nose cone. And there you see the nose cone falls off, and then you just basically tuck out and bail out with a parachute. For spaceship two, they bail out. They have a bailout scenario that's. Uh, in case the, the winged re-entry during upper atmospheric entry is, is with a, uh, the capsule feathered, the, I mean, with, with, with the uh, wings feathered, and then the wings have to come back to a landing configuration um, unfeathered. And if the feathering system doesn't unfeather, they all of the crew, including the, uh, the crew and the uh, passengers have to bail out. So they have an individual bailout system. And fortunate for that, when Spaceship Two broke apart in uh, 2014, this was two weeks after, or a week after Alan Eustace broke Mach 1, um, the vehicle for a variety of human factors basically broke apart um, because it went into the uh, feathered condition uh, immediately after, uh, or shortly after engine ignition. And there you see the Basically, the engine is firing in the opposite direction. The vehicle is broken off. Its wings are falling apart. Um, and um, Pete Siebold, who was in the left seat, uh, survived. And he was unconscious during the breakup. But the capsule or the, the space, the wing vehicle broke apart. The crew module broke apart. And he was thrown out of it and his parachute open. Um, this was not intended to do uh, to be a breakup. Uh, scenario, uh, but it saved his life nonetheless. Um, ejection seats have been used extensively in spacecraft, and I'll go through a little bit of the history there. For all six of the Vostok space flights, which set the first orbital records, including the first woman in space, um, they did not trust the capsule parachute system with coming down in a slow enough uh, impact to, to be survivor or at least to have serious injuries. So as a result of that, they put an ejection seat in and that would ejection seat would kick the crew out just prior to the capsule, you know, um, fully uh, coming down under parachute. I, ironically, for a record to be set, you have to take off and land in the same spacecraft or aircraft. And technically, the uh, first flights to orbit did not land and take off in the same uh, vehicle because of the ejection seat. 
just quibbling over terms, but it wasn't a successful use of all uh, on all six of the Vostok missions. It was decided in Gemini, rather than use a tractor rocket, the weight system was too high that they actually went with a uh, off the shelf uh, F-106 ejection seat and pressure suit. So the Gemini uh, spacecraft had ejection seats, including scarily the ability to eject off the pad. Um, but you can imagine how, you know, you, obviously you're facing sideways and somehow you've got to get enough altitude for the parachute to come down. But this, this was a very scary system. And there was one time where they almost had to do a pad ejection. Um, and the, the crew elected not to because they knew their chances were pretty slim. Um, ejection seats, ironically, were used in the space shuttle on the, the prior to the actual uh, orbital flights in Columbia, the Enterprise flew approach and landing tests where it was kicked off of a 747 and then um, did touchdown tests and they had ejection seats in that system. Now, the problem with ejection seats is the, if you look at this cockpit, you can see obviously something's wrong here. How do you eject when you have this massive array of overhead switches and panels? Well, the ejection seat, when you initiated ejection, it had to roll back about four feet, blow hatches above an area that was clear of switch panels and eject. So that would, it would actually work, but it would take several seconds longer because of the, uh, it was not an instant egress path from our overhead ejection. It was used on the four flights of orbital flight program in shuttle. And then after that, the seats were taken out. Now the Russians had a space shuttle called Buran and it had a very robust ejection system, uh, which is based on this Vezda K-36 ejection seat, which is used in all of their modern fighters. Uh, and a, uh, a a, a very uh, eloquently designed escape suit, uh, which you see here on the left, that's the stretch suit. And the stretch suit has got thermal protection. It's got a lot of features and it. it basically, uh, it was tested in very unique ways, which besides being tested in high speed ejections from a MiG-25 at Mach plus one, during um, uh, five flights, uh, to resupply the space station with the progress, they put an ejection seat on the top of the progress resupply capsule and ejected this seat out with a, a mannequin. And um, so they were testing them in the real environment, which was, you know, above Mach 3 and, and above, you know, 30 kilometers, you know, well above 100,000 feet. And so they actually successfully tested this suit and the ejection seat in that environment using a, a, a rocket launch. Now, the problem when they were looking at the putting ejection seats back in the space shuttle was even when they had ejection seats in the first four flights, you had a chance of hitting the shuttle engine plume with very hot temperatures. And so, they said, well, let's make something that can survive that ejection into a uh, hot engine plume. And so this was one of the ideas in the consideration for putting ejection seats back in the space shuttle. Um, believe it or not, they actually tested extraction rockets for the space shuttle. This was uh, uh, out at Hurricane Mesa in Utah where they tested an ejection uh, extraction rocket. Uh, there's a uh, uh, shuttle hatch and the problem is that eventually this uh, this was rejected because for a variety of reasons one is it had a very low envelope for use and the other is now you had active rocket uh, you know basically missiles inside the space shuttle so this was rejected but it was tested and, and you know evaluated they've also looked at encapsulated seats uh, and encapsulated seats based on similar to the B-58 Hustler seat uh, was uh, uh, developed in the early 60s. And these are just some of the various escape pods that were uh, uh, evaluated. Uh, eventually that was rejected. Um, modular systems, however, were also considered in the aftermath of the Columbia mishap. 
And the problem is you had to have something that would pull the uh, space shuttle forward fuselage off of the space shuttle body. And as you can see there, um, you would have to have a really big tractor rocket to do that. The other thing is, how do you get rid of this thing uh, on, you have to get rid of it on ascent. And to get rid of it, you have to fire the rocket engines and then throw all that rocket blast into the space shuttle tile, which is very fragile. Plus you got to make sure that the windscreen isn't damaged by it. So you had to have these shields. So it required an extensive amount of cons all these different things. The other thing is you had to have pyrotechnics that would separate uh, the forward fuselage from the shuttle. And then um, they looked at, well, we need to have airbags to bring that hole down. As you remember seeing the, the, uh, 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 the uh, airbag uh, system test uh, uh, for the uh, uh, early uh, systems like the uh, F F-111 and the uh, um, uh, uh, the other one I showed you the video of, and they, they, what they realized is that a three airbag system wasn't sufficient. So they had to have this monster big five airbag system to dissipate the uh, impact loads. The bottom line is that all the weight of all these systems was such that um, it would require, now you could no longer carry payload because the forward, the, the center gravity was changed so drastically. So basically this was also rejected. And this was another concept where the forward fuselage would separate from the crew module. Again, more pyrotechnics. So all those kinds of things uh, eventually led to, and I'll, I'll talk about modular separation of the crew uh, with some hybrid ideas, which included a pod in the payload bay with uh, ejection seats. And this pod would be inside the payload bay right behind the aft fuselage uh, or aft uh, bulkhead. And the crew would get into this thing, and then they they would be the pod would be ejected, and then the ejection seats would fire. So, bottom line is that there were solutions that were very technically sophisticated and potentially useful, but they totally, you know, re re remove the opportunity for carrying any payload. Um, so there are a lot of factors that go into the decision for what kind of escape system to use. Um, a whole variety of things that. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, mobility effects and crew uh, performance and duties is always affected. It was very common for the shuttle pilots, the, to the uh, commander and pilot in the, in the front seats, to take off their gloves because the gloves would affect their ability to sense rotational hand controller inputs when they were manually flying the vehicle. So now they would not wear their gloves. And as a result of that, the suit was totally ineffective. So it's very important in any escape technology to take into consideration the effects on crew duties, both nominal and off nominal. Um, we'll talk a little bit about safe havens. Safe havens are a concept where you have some uh, ability to keep crew in a, in a survivable environment. Uh, and I, uh, I'll talk about spacecraft systems, but I, I'll go back into historical records. They actually had a safe haven in aircraft. Um, because of unpressurized aircraft flights, crew members could uh, develop decompression sickness. And if any of you are doing mountaineering, you'll be familiar with the Gamoff bag or in uh, undersea environments, they have this uh, hyperbaric recompressible stretchers uh, like the Hyperlite. Um, this was developed in World War II to treat crew members who had the bends in the aircraft on the mission. And it's interesting, uh, Winston Churchill liked to fly to meetings and because of his you know, health issues, he was in a, a small pressurized gondola inside the, air, the unpressurized aircraft. So safe haven is used when the vehicle becomes, it has a, you know, a non-survivable atmosphere or a pressure environment. And safe havens were used uh, in Apollo 13 when the uh, service module um, oxygen tank blew up and damaged the vehicle and they all had to go into the lunar module. And the lunar module was only meant to keep two crew alive for 48 hours and it had to keep three crew alive for three days. And there was a lot of kludgy things they had to do with the uh, 
uh, carbon dioxide scrubber, but they successfully were able to come back home using that safe haven. When the shuttle after Columbia happened, there, there was concern that the shuttle could sustain damage that would um, uh, prevent them from making a successful reentry. So they now had an ability to do a safe haven on the ISS. And so this was called the CSCS, Contingency Shuttle Crew Support, where the crew would have basically take shelter in, this, in the ISS. The shuttle crew would take shelter in it. So they would have, uh, they had to go through a whole thing. How do you bring a crew that's been deconditioned back? And they had to um, develop all these procedures. And so this was called the STS-300 mission that was used for the first two return to flight missions for the, the space shuttle after the Columbia mishap, which happened in 2003. And so they would have essentially a second shuttle, which would be the next shuttle in line to go. It would be a launch on need if it needed to, it could come rescue the crew from the space station. So that was the, uh, successfully demonstrated that you could do a safe haven and abort to uh, the space station. And the crew would be brought back in recumbent positions in the mid deck. So let's talk about crew transfer now as another uh, concern. These are just some of the artists' uh, renditions of various kinds of crew transfer systems. Um, now, the one on the very bottom right is the uh, uh, personal rescue sphere that was developed uh, for the space shuttle. And this would be allow crew to transfer from one shuttle to the other uh, by going into this small um, pressurized uh, ball. And this was actually used as a test for astronauts uh, candidates to show if they had claustrophobia or not. And uh, here you can see that um, this was the first female astronaut crew uh, with their personal rescue sphere picture. Um, it was tested in the airlock and it was, it was never flown, but it was tested and flight certified if it needed to be. Um, there was a rescue mission that was planned for Skylab 4 because the crew mod, the uh, command module for Skylab 4 had some uh, engine uh, concerns. And so they were going to send up a rescue mission to bring the Skylab 4 crew back. They flew 84 day mission uh, in the early 70s. Anyway, um, so they would take two crew members up in an Apollo capsule and bring the three uh, uh, Skylab crew members down, two of which would have to stay below the, the uh, pallet, as you can see here. It was almost launched, but they managed to fix the engines or work around the en engine problem for the command module and brought Skylab 4 back in their original command module. Um, crew rescue transfer vehicle to vehicle was considered uh, as part of the uh, analysis after the Columbia mishap. Um, and then it was actually implemented for uh, the first, uh, one of the flights after um, the Columbia mishap that didn't go to the space station was the final Hubble servicing mission, uh, STS-25 in, in, in 2009. So because there was no safe haven, i.e. there was no ISS access for the Hubble repair mission, they had a backup shuttle on the pad, train crew ready to go during that mission. And it was called STS-400. And they had their, this is their patch. Um, you can see it's kind of cool, the rescue patch. And this mission was trained and, and ready to go um, and, uh, but was not was not actually launched because the the uh, the uh, Hubble shuttle Atlantis did an inspection and didn't find any damage, so they said we could come back okay. But here we see for the first time two uh, shuttles on the pad A and B ready to launch. Uh, the front one is the uh, STS-125, and the and the back one was the STS-400 mission. Uh, that was ready to go rescue them. And they to do that, they had to, um, unlike the Columbia, which didn't have a remote, a, a remote manipulator arm, uh, the, the, this mission had a specially designed attach point on Atlantis uh, so that they could attach the uh, uh, 
Endeavor STS-400 to it and then do a vehicle to vehicle transfer in spacesuits. Let's talk a little bit about reentry. Reentry is a, a, a very dynamic time. You're converting uh, kinetic energy to um, you know, thermal energy. And there've been a lot of uh, very close calls in reentry. Um, this is a picture of shot from the space station of a Soyuz coming back in. And at the very bottom, that little white dot there is the aerodynamic descent module and the other two modules, the orbital module and the service module above are burning up. And you could see it as the uh, burn up pro progresses. So something aer not aerodynamically is not going to come back. Okay. So the Soyuz uh, for reentry has to separate the center descent module from the orbital module on the right and the service or inner uh, instrument control module on the left to get to the lowest mass and landing weight. And to do that, it uses pyrotechnics to separate them. And those pyrotechnics have to fire flawlessly, which they have not always done. Uh, in fact, um, on Soyuz 11, um, which went to the uh, first space station, Soyuz 1, the crew, um, they had a choice. They could go three crew without suits or two with suits. And so the management decided, hey, we want to set a record. It was going to be, a, a it was a 22-day mission to Soyuz 1, first space station mission for the Soviet Union. They flew three guys. Well, unfortunately, uh, they had a successful mission on Soyuz 1. They're coming back. And that descent module has to separate from those other two modules. And in doing so, there were, the pyrotechnics stuttered. They jolted the sh and shook the capsule around and opened an equalization valve at a couple hundred thousand feet. As a result of that, the um, inside the inside the descent module, the crew recognizes, oh my God, we're depressurizing. And so they're trying to shut the isolation valve, but it was a stem valve like you have in a garden hose. And it took too many times and they finally uh, all passed out and succumbed to hypoxia and then eventually ebulism. We did an analysis of this mishap as well, including the autopsy analysis. Here you can see the crew uh, recovery force is trying to revive uh, the unfortunate Soyuz 11 crew. We learned a lot from that unfortunate thing. We'll talk a little bit about crew return and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between winged vehicles and blunt bodies. So, um, Anytime you're coming back from space, you've got to have a number of parameters that you have to have just right to do that. And it has to deal with um, G loads for the crew and for the structure, heating loads for the vehicle, um, trying to land somewhere where you can have a recovery forces there and also that you're not in a dangerous zone, like you wouldn't want to land in a mountain range. Uh, and so there's this entry corridor, which is shown here. Um, and um, you have to fly this in either side of that entry corridor is a potential danger zone to either crew and occupant or structures of uh, integrity. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between blunt body capsules and lifting bodies. Um, and one thing that happens is you go, well, what, what's better? And the, the reality is it depends. There are advantages and disadvantages to a blunt body and a winged vehicle. A blunt body is, uh, is gonna have a lower lift to drag ratio, generally around 0.2, which is what the Soyuz and Apollo had versus a, uh, a, um, a winged vehicle that's gonna have a lift to drag ratio of say three or four. So it, it's gonna be able to glide and go a certain further distance. The key component here is that one gets you down uh, and gives you, it gives you a limited ability to go side to side on your reentry path. Now, why would you wanna go side to side to get closer to re recovery forces? In the case of a winged vehicle, you wanna come back and land on a runway. 
Okay, so you need to have maneuverability to do that. And a blunt capsule cannot do that. It's gonna have a, a much narrower reentry corridor to land in compared to a wing vehicle. So basically what you make up for in cross range or the ability to maneuver off your reentry path, you, uh, uh, you, you limit uh, your ability to do, do that with a blunt capsule. But what you get with a blunt capsule is volumetric efficiency. And volumetric efficiency is essentially um, the volume versus cross-sectional area. So, um, and, and it makes sense, you don't, a wing is gonna give you a lot more cross-sectional area and less uh, volume for payload and crew. So that's the basic difference between a uh, winged vehicle with a high lift to drag cross range capability, but a, but a much less volumetric efficiency. And now we've noticed this trend of going back to blunt capsules. And they're, they're generally, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a simpler system to use. But there, there are a number of wing vehicles that have either been in consideration, like the X-38 Assured Crew Return Vehicle that was uh, um, designed and uh, tested by NASA. Um, we have the Dream Chaser, which is an orbital vehicle that's, that's very close to flight ready. Um, the, uh, there's even a group at uh, UC Davis um, uh, with Steve Robinson, who's developed a module that can fit in the in one of these winged vehicles, like the uh, Dream Chaser, or what's shown here in this configuration is the X-37B, which is an orbital test vehicle that the uh, Air Force is using. They have one up in space that's been up there for 900 days, and it can come back down and land on a runway. So wing vehicles are re really useful for returning an injured or debil debilitated crew because the G-loading is much less. You can land on a runway, you have a nice soft runway touchdown versus a you know, rear end car collision with a, um, uh, with a, uh, um, with a, a capsule. So let's talk about some novel things that are out there. One is the idea is, uh, inflatable aerodynamic decelerators and they're very uh they're used extensively in upper uh in deep space uh atmospheric capture like say going to mars because you can have a very low volumetric uh efficiency when you don't need to have a lot of volume or you have uh, you don't have to have a lot of cross-sectional area but then when you want cross-sectional area you can have have it so essentially, it's like having the best of both worlds. High volumetric efficiency for a caps that a capsule has, but high uh, wing surface area uh, to reduce uh, landing loads and, and give you cross range. And so this was, a, uh, this was a one that flew in the 60s. It was meant to carry crew as a rescue pod. Uh, it was called fabric fabrication of inflatable reentry structures test. And it did fly. And uh, this was the artist conceptions of it, kind of a regalo wing design um, with the pod inside. The, the device that was flown, uh, which you see, this is a test article here, uh, just brought back a, a payload as, as part of its demonstration test. And it worked, um, but it was never pursued for you know, a variety of reasons, mostly that, that uh, people didn't feel uh, um, th that it would be the best thing for bringing crew back. Uh, and, here, and here you can see some of the test articles uh, in works. So, but it did bring a payload back. Um, there was also a bailout capability called uh, manned orbital operations safety equipment. It was originally called man out of space easiest. And uh, they decided they would give it a more professional name. But basically it's a bailout system that you kick out, you do a deorbit burn, uh, and then you uh, come down uh, with this blunt body uh, capsule and then a parachute system. Aerodynamic decelerators, like I said, are, being, are used extensively in aero capture for say Mars or any, any kind of planetary surface where there's an atmosphere. And there are a few planets and, and objects out there that have some atmosphere. So the idea of escaping uh, with crew on board is actually uh, 
uh, farther along than you might realize. Um, and the idea is you have this backpack, you kick out, say, abandon the space station, inflate the aeroshell, and then come down and land. And there's a company that's doing this, NPO Levuchkin, uh, in the uh, in Russia, and it's basically uh, they've also developed one that could do a, a jump out of a tall building, like say, in, when the 9/11 uh, terrorist attack occurred in the Twin Towers, a system like this could have safely brought somebody back from, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 Twin Towers at a very high altitude, and they've actually done drop tests. This is a uh, a test subject who's been dropped off of a building and you can see him wearing a Sokol suit. Um, so there are systems like this that are out there being tested. Um, so here's the, here's the inflatable uh, uh, re-entry system. Here you see very high volumetric efficiency, very low cross-sectional area in the uh, stowed configuration and then in the, the, the deployed configuration, it now has this kind of shuttlecock appearance that could bring a crew member back. Um, so where are we here? I'm gonna show you some stuff. This is, uh, you know, is, is uh, th these are systems that are in development right now as we speak. I'll show you the, this is the test concept. Uh, I can't mention the group that's doing it, but it, uh, suffice it to say that it's being heavily uh, looked at. And DARPA and, 2015 did a uh, atmospheric reentry conference, and we had a, a lot of technical discussions on some of the ways to do this. And then this is just the artist's conception of how that would occur. You're inside this uh, protective thermal protected aeroshell with the pressure suit uh, surviving the uh, uh, reentry. Okay, let's talk a little bit about quickly about landing. Like I said, you're not home till you're safe at home. Here's a, a Apollo 15, a pyrotechnic uh, or a uh, reaction control jet cut a cable on one of the parachutes for Apollo 15. Had a little harder landing, but still safe. Um, wing vehicles landing is not assured. Now uh, this one was a really bad accident rollover that uh, caused serious injury to the crew member. Um, the one before that was uh, was just the vehicle broke up, not the uh, but the crew member was able to fly again. Uh, here's a, a series of pictures showing Spaceship One uh, with what we would call a ground loop, basically as a landing gear failure and comes to rest. Um, but obviously that was not a good good day. Um, I'm going to skip through this uh, stuff on uh, capsule landings. Basically, you know we have uh, Water landings, which are very uh, known entities, we've done a lot of those, but landing on land, you've got a lot of things that you could hit along the way. And so you need to have airbags to dissipate energy. And obviously if you land on a cliff, which has happened in one uh, Soyuz mission that had an ascent aboard, the, the, got, the, the capsule rolled down a cliff and if it weren't for the parachute snagging some trees, they would have gone off the cliff. Um, I'm going to skip through this um, and talk a little bit about uh, post landing is always an issue. We had one crew that landed in a frozen lake and the recovery forces couldn't get to them. And um, what happened is the capsule actually went inverted. So there are uh, valves that could give them access to clean air uh, was covered up. And uh, you can see that the parachute actually acted like a sea anchor and they finally got the guys out the next day, but that was a very close call. Oh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the fatality and survival envelope. And here you see altitude on the y-axis and Mach uh, speed on the x-axis. And what you see here is all these red dots are deaths. Uh, these are two parachute deaths, so zero airspeed, but at, exposed to the vacuum of, or near vacuum. The two SR-71 breakups only resulted in one fatality, uh, and that was uh, uh, the backseater of Bill Weaver's flight that broke, had his neck broken by shock interactions. And we have the fatalities of the uh, Challenger, which was actually pretty slow. It was only Mach 2 and 50,000 feet. If, remember, they survived the breakup. They didn't survive the impact with water. And then the, the Columbia mishap was, it, uh, it was at roughly Mach 10 and it was 
uh, the equivalent um, uh, pounds per square foot were approximately 400 pounds per square foot, much like the uh, SR-71 breakup. So these, uh, although there was fatalities here, if you, as you see on the next slide, there were also survivals. And so what we're trying to do is to point out the fact that some people live and some people die. And if we can figure out how to make this less problematic, that's a good thing. So I come up with this chart that has all the different uh, health threats, and uh, I won't go into detail on it um, other than say it's in this book chapter I have that I have electronically. If you want, I can send you a copy of it. I put this in for reference purposes. This is a, a, an a interactive slide that NASA keeps up with every bad thing that's ever happened in space. And if you go to this website at the bottom here, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you can actually um, you can actually click on these links and it will blow up more technical detail. So I want to talk at the, uh, towards the end about the very thing that's kind of what our current uh, efforts are in. Water at body temperature uh, reaches its vapor pressure at uh, 47 millimeters of mercury, which is equivalent pressure of about 63,000 feet. Um, the absence of pressure is actually far more fatal than the absence of oxygen or the uh, thermal. Uh, and we can live days uh, without water and weeks without food. And gravity, we've had people that have lived over 800 days. We have three people that have had 800 days in space without gravity, and they're still doing fine. What will kill you the fastest is the absence of atmosphere and pressure. I want to show you this video. And what it is, is a, uh, it's a, a chamber we're doing studies in, and there's a tray of water there. And the tray of water, um, you can see the pressure gauge, and the tray of water uh, turns from a liquid to a gas. And then as it gets to another altitude, which we'll talk about, it turns to ice. So we always thought Armstrong's line, which is where water turns from a liquid to a vapor, vapor is a bad thing. But what we realize now is that about twice that altitude, about uh, 120,000 feet, water turns from a liquid and gas to a, a solid. So here's this video. It's almost there. There we go. Right now, look at the oh. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, that that is. Every day. Oh yeah. my God. You see how fast it goes. Yeah. And so if you, right now you have boiling and frozen at the same time. So that, that's what causes uh, damage to the body. Uh, the most fatal immediate concern is damage to the lung. And this is actual, you know, what normal lung looks like, two alveolar cell layers thick, around blood vessels, too. And this is actual human tissue from uh, the Columbia mishap that shows what happens to ebulism. What happens from the exposure to extreme altitudes to the lung tissue. And it's basically the water vapor and the water that's on the alveolar surface causes this massive alveolar disruption. Um, this is, and this is what space ice it looks like. So imagine the problem you have in a high altitude above Armstrong's line is water vapor. But when you get to about twice that altitude, 120,000 feet or so, you get ice crystals. So if it wasn't bad enough to have bubbles in your system, it's ice crystals now. So we're now looking at this issue of what is the difference? What is the true physiologic equivalent of space? Is it Armstrong's line or is it the triple point? And um, so we, we think that the triple point where ice and bubbles form is probably more injurious than Armstrong's line itself. Um, this is a list of all the human fatalities. I also have a book chapter that has all this uh, written down too. If you'd like, I can send you a copy. Um, this is a test we did last year um, in uh, the Midland Altitude Chamber Complex. They have a 10-man and a two-man chamber, and we we're, uh, we're doing a rodent study. Um, and uh, I'll just briefly show we, what we were trying to do was to see what was the difference in this pilot study between the triple point above 120,000 and the uh, above uh, Armstrong's line, 60, 70,000 feet. And basically, um, you know, obviously if you're higher, it's going to take longer to descend, but also it's more injurious from a standpoint of 
the um, you know uh, water vapor uh, coming out of liquid coming out of solution is not nearly as bad as as this exposure to the ice forming component. And we're actually looking at uh, com uh, coming up with a new classification system uh, and um, and looking at some of the protective measures. This is a list of references uh, with the different chapters I can uh, make available to you. I have most, I have all these electronically actually. Um, so crew survivability should be a, a major, major driver in uh, mission architecture and, uh, and vehicle design. We are a big proponent of looking at old mishaps and seeing are there lessons learned for new scenarios. Um, we always have to plan for the worst case scenario because invariably stuff, bad stuff happens. Um, generally, you've got to take into consideration nominal operations in your crew survival systems development. Um, advanced technologies are out there. We're actively looking at some of the ways that we can implement those effectively. And the uh, bottom line is it's better to build the survival component in early than to try to uh, change it after the product, uh, production model is made. Here's this book chapter I was talking about that uh, just came out, Crew Escape and Survival Systems, for which much of this um, uh, talk has been. Uh, these books um, are NASA books on recovery and reentry and mishaps, and I've, those are available electronically. Um, I don't have Space Rescue electronically, but I have this really cool book on dressing for altitude, which has got, uh, it's the history of pressure suits from the early days up to maybe 10 years ago. Um, these are the two survival books, uh, the air medical lessons learned from the Columbia mishap and the Columbia survival investigation report. I have those electronically. And let's see here. Oh yeah, these are, um, these are some really good books on uh, survival, you know, um, just for reference. And I do have this book, Human Physiology in Extreme Environments, uh, electronically. I don't have these two uh, except a hard copy. They're really great books if you want to dig deeper into this. So with that, I'll uh, see if we have time for a few questions and then uh, let you guys go. Thanks for sticking with me. you guys hear me? Yes, we can, sir. I just want to say that was an absolutely amazing talk. Thank you so much. I mean, clearly so much experience, so much knowledge. I'm really, well, frankly, honoured to have uh, been able to listen to you speak. So I just, I've not got a question. I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And here's the deal. My role now is to pass the torch. <laughs> so you know, I'm looking for the, you know, the next generation to, to uh, take forward whatever cause you love, whether it's space or aircraft or what, you know, um, you know, you've got to love what you do. Well, thanks very much. You're really inspiring and really fired my rockets about uh, survival in space. Cool. Yeah, contact me if you like, and I can send you uh, those, elect I've got a lot of this stuff electronically. Um, and we're, we're, I'm, believe it or not, despite Red Bull Stratus and the second su supersonic stratospheric freefall st uh, stratic space dive, there's st we're still actively got projects ongoing. So we're always pushing the envelope and hopefully you all will join us. Thank you very much, sir. Hello, yeah, it's just Mark here. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Um, my line just dropped out. My connection dropped out when you had the um, slide. I think with the, I think it was the graph, and it had about 30, 40 Gs on it. Oh yeah, I'll send you a copy of that. Um, which, which was that one? The one from World War II? I think so. Yeah, the line sort of cut out. But was that from a parachute um, jump? Was it? Um, yes, yeah, so it was this. Okay. It was a it was a whole bunch of jumps with uh, they actually were using uh, instrument and mannequins, mm. and they had this dog, this Saint Bernard called Major, and uh, he was a you know a rescue dog, and they they uh, they used him as a, one of the test dummies, as well as oh. humans too. So 
Um, there's been a lot of work. Actually, the UK done, uh, it, it, it probably is still classified. The Farnborough work that was done, you know, after World War II on uh, ejection seat spins and all, we were very interested in that data uh, when we were doing Red Bull Stratus and we couldn't get access to it. So if you guys have access to some of that stuff, you could, even the old literature is extremely valuable because we, we were doing tests that we couldn't do today. We couldn't do them on animals, let alone people. Um, and so a lot of times we're gonna have to go back and look at that old data and try to mine it for useful information. And joys of 1950s ethics, I suppose. Well, it was a different era, you know? I mean, you know, it was, it was I, and I was heavily involved in research and human test subjects. And I often did some of the, I would do every run, uh, whether it was on a, uh, one of our motion centrifuge devices or in the altitude chambers or whatever. I, I as a medical monitor, I, I would always do it before I put anybody else in there just so I knew, hey, what was the, you know, what was the risk uh, we, were, we were facing? Uh, one quick question going ahead. When they're talking about deep space and missions back to the moon and Mars, what are they looking at? Are they looking at um, uh, escape systems for much further out once you've left the Earth orbit? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, obviously we've spent the majority of our spaceflight experience. Um, we have, for example, um, we only have like 250 human days in lunar or deep space exposures. And, and we've got, um, I don't know, hundreds, tens of thousands of days in low Earth orbit. So the amount of time we have in, in deep space in the Apollo uh, series of flights is, is appallingly little. Now, I know, we, we're, and so obviously we're going to come back to Mother Earth uh, if we can. Um, but when you start get going to the moon, you know, besides the fact that you've got calm delays, it's, you know, it's a quarter of a million miles away. So it's, it's a, at best a three or four day transit to get back here to, to Mars. It's 35 million miles away. Calm. I mean, calm, you don't even have calm some of the times. And for the most the rest of the time, it's, you know, eight to 20 minutes, a one way calm delay. So you don't have real time communication. So uh, if things at the speed of light take minutes, imagine what it takes to move something physically. So we're going to have to have some new ideas, which is basically pre-deployed safe havens, you know, backup plans to everything because stuff, bad stuff can happen. And we do not have the immediate ability or even the near term ability to return. So it's gonna require a lot more uh, thinking and also a much higher risk acceptance of things. Um, invariably, it's gonna be a, a lot more challenging. Yeah, thank you. That's quite quite remarkable. When you say 250 days in to total experience, well, one, one Mars trip will easily outstrip that. That's incredible. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, but we do have people that have flown over 600 days or, or 800 days, but they're in the, I think we've got like in the teens for over 600 days, which is barely enough time to go there and come back. And for the most part, the it's 800 days is probably a minimum to do anything useful. We have three people that have done that. So we know that people can survive microgravity, but it's the deep space, the radiation, the, uh, I mean, there's a lot of factors. One, I do a talk on it. I have a YouTube channel that has a couple of these talks, but you know, when, when people were on the moon, they would lo love to see the earth. And the earth was, if you hold your thumb out at arm's length, that's the size that the moon was, is your thumbnail. But it still looked like the earth. When you look at, they have a, I have a picture of the moon, I mean, of, of earth from Mars. It's a tiny little pencil dot. It's like a speck of dust on your screen. You know, that's what it looks like. You can magnify it or whatever, but it's not, it, 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 you, you definitely don't have that same level of, oh, there's Earth, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go, you know. Yeah, thank you for that. That's quite remarkable. Well, 
um, anyway, it was such an honor to, to get, be able to uh, talk to you all and hopefully inspire and pass the torch to you all because you're the future, truly. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good afternoon. You too now. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir. Thank you.